check. Amen. Thank you, choir. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship. 
those who are gathered here in the sanctuary, as well as those who are watching us by a live stream online. Let us remember the words of the psalmist right, who writes, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Just a few items to share with you this morning as we head into this time of worship. If you have a special prayer need today, please know uh, that Brandy Lionberger will be in the pastor's study, which is through these double doors on your right, and then take an immediate right. And uh, she would be uh, pleased to, to pray with you immediately following worship. Uh, Wednesday night, choir practice 515, and we have the normal meal and Bible study at 6 and 6.30. On Saturday, men's prayer breakfast is at 8 o'clock. So men of the church, Saturday at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, a couple of, just a couple of more items here for the ladies. On July 19th, so not this coming Friday, but the next Friday, there is a carry-in that Friday night for uh, the ladies. Now, this is just an interesting tidbit. I grew up calling a the meal when everybody brings things in, a carry-in. But when I was serving my first call in Edgington, Illinois, I announced a carry-in dinner, and nobody knew what in the world I was talking about. They're like, why in the world would you, would you have a dead bird dinner, a carry-in meal? It's like, oh, a potluck, right? So if you're not familiar with carry-in, it's a potluck. Okay. And then in October, I think it's in October, yeah, the Women of Joy uh, are, are having a function in Branson, and several ladies have signed up to go. We do have one extra ticket, and if you were wanting to go to Branson and you didn't get signed up initially, please see Shailene just as soon as possible, and she can explain all the details for you about that. Then we are setting up for Vacation Bible School on Saturday, July 20th at 9 a.m., and we need help setting up. So if you are available to come down to the church Saturday morning, July 20th at nine o'clock, it won't take very long. Many hands make light work, but we have a number of children signed up for Vacation Bible School that next week. And we just wanna make this just a great week for the children. I'd like to ask Matt to come up uh, for his announcement regarding the mission trip. Good morning, everybody. I have got three re requests this morning. Um, July 14 through 19 is our mission trip. We are going to Eldora, Iowa to an Angel Tree Camp. Uh, this is high school and middle school students from our group will be going and running a camp for elementary age students. These students um, generally have one of two things going on in their life. Either their parents have passed away or their parents are incarcerated. Um, so we covet your prayers as we go to serve and love on these kids. Um, these kids come from very, very rough backgrounds and um, ha haven't had the, the best of hands dealt to them. So we're going to go love on these kids. So I cover your prayers as we go. Um, the next thing that I ask is we are still looking for a couple more gals to go along. I don't care what your age is. This is not a labor intensive thing. All you have to do is basically um, be willing to sleep in an air-conditioned cabin and love on little kids that might be a little, um, a little high on life at times and bounce off the walls. But that's what we need. We need, um, you know, we'll take more guys too, but we do have quite a few uh, guys going. We are looking for a couple more gals to go of any age from middle school uh, up through adult. If you are going, man, God's been laying it on my heart to do something and this might be it, please come see me after church. Um, so that is um, what we have going on. If you are available, if you are willing to serve, um, we would love to use you. The last thing, number three, is um, we have a number of kids requesting a scholarship. Um, they just can't afford to pay to go. If you're willing to help with that, the cost is $150. Um, if you'd like to sponsor someone, please see me afterwards as well. So that's what I have. Um, let's continue now with our call to worship. If you would rise and pass the peace of the Lord, and then we will have our call to worship. Grace and peace.
Would you join me now in our responsive call to worship as is on the screens and in your bulletin? The call of freedom has sounded. Lord, Lord, may we respond as a community of freedom. It concerns each of us personally, in our community, in our country, in our world, in our humanity, and in our faith. Lord, Lord. This week, Americans celebrated their national freedom. As citizens, we share in that celebration. Today, Christians celebrate their spiritual freedom. As a regime, we share in that celebration. It is absolutely clear that God has called us to freedom. Jesus came. Now, our freedom is not an excuse to do as we please. Instead, we are free to serve God and one another. Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. Please be seated. As we gather as the people of God to worship God in his fullness, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it, it is important that we do so in a way that God desires. And that includes the way in which we come to the table that has been set before us. The Apostle Paul uh, in one of his earliest letters to the church at Corinth, gives guidance on how it is that we are to properly come to the Lord's table to receive the sacrament. He writes, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine themselves then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon themselves. 
So this morning, I invite you to join me in the unison prayer of confession found in your bulletin, and it will be on the screen before you. We'll then have a time of personal silent confession before receiving the assurance of God's pardon of our sins. Will you please pray with me? God of mercy, there's no greater feeling of liberation than to experience freedom from sin provided for us by Christ. This Independence Weekend, we're grateful for freedom in you. We're reminded of those who sacrifice and have sacrificed following the example of Christ, that we have freedom to worship you. Help us to live lives that show awareness of your gift of freedom from sin, lives that glorify you. Help us to lead others to your freedom, to strive to live without sin, and to live faithfully into your freedom. Amen. When we confess our sins to the Lord, it's important that we hear the promise of forgiveness, that, that we hear fresh on our ears the assurance of pardon. The prophet Ezekiel, living some 550 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, receiving an oracle from God, writes, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all of your impurities and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from your heart a heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. This beautiful act of the Lord is completed, is fulfilled through the life, death, and bodily resurrection from the grave of the Lord Jesus Christ. So on this beautiful summer Sabbath morning, let us remember the promises that God makes to us in our baptisms as we celebrate that in Jesus we are a forgiven people. Hallelujah. Amen. Will you please rise as you're able. be seated. At this time, if the children would come forward for the children's message. today. Good. I'm so glad to hear that. Let me ask you a question. Who here has ever went into a vegetable garden and found, yeah, put your hand up, and found a weed? I found a weed. You found a weed? Did you pull the weed? Oh, in, in Grandpa's garden, there was a weed? I didn't pull it out. Oh, you didn't pull it out. And there was a bottle underneath my Grandpa's basement. Okay. I had to get that taken care of. That's right. So, 
Uh huh. And he got it dried out, didn't he? Yep. Very good. Very good. So it's okay. Sounds good. So if you've ever been to a garden, you know that weeds like to come up. And if you work really hard in the garden, you, you get your soil just right and you plant your seed and you hope, really hope that it comes up. But then all of a sudden all this other stuff comes up with it. And what do you do with those weeds? You have to pull them out. You have to pull them out. Do you have to be careful when you pull them out? Yeah. Why? Well, well, they might have worms on them, but, but you might pull out what when you pull out the weeds? Plant. All right. So what if we take those same seeds and we were to throw them in bad soil? What might happen? They, yeah, they might not grow. Now, when you hear the scripture today, it's going to talk about soils. It, it's, I know it's going to be talking about having a garden. And what happens when we throw our seed in good soil, in soil that has weeds in it, and in rocky soil? And that's all referring to our spiritual life. And it's referring to our faith and how our faith grows. And that our faith is very, very, very important to have good soil. And what do you think good soil then means? If we're talking about our faith, and planting seeds in good soil, what do you think that may, means? That we are in a church that believes in God's Word, a church that believes in Jesus, a church that has Sunday school, um, a church that encourages us to love others the way Jesus loves us. Do you think that's all important? Yes. Yes. That's right. In our church. Yes. Yes. That we want you to be in good soil. We want your guys' faith to grow. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right here. You see this? These plants were probably in really, really, really good soil. Don't they look pretty? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, we want to be like the plants that when they grow, they have a crop. You know, if you put a plant in the ground and it gave you one green bean and then it died, you'd go, well, that doesn't seem like it's worth it. But if you have a whole bunch of fruit, we bear fruit like those good plants. We want to have a green bean crop that has dozens and dozens of green beans on it, right? Yes. So we want to be a crop that is bearing good fruit for God. All right? So let's work hard. Let's study God's Word, and we will try to be like a good crop bearing good fruit. Okay? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Gracious God, you love us. And at times we find ourselves in life not bearing very good fruit. But you call us to bear good fruit. You call us to be a reflection of Jesus. So when we talk to others, when we act wherever we are, God, help us to be a reflection of Jesus. Help us to be kind and encouraging people, even in, the, in times of frustration and disappointment. Help us to be like Jesus. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
This morning's scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 1 through 20. Hear now the word of the Lord. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, which all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teachings said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell on the path, and the birds came and they ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it didn't have much soil. So it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked out the plants, so that they did not bear grain. But still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, it grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve and others around him asked him about the parables. And he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand the parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown in rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. But still others, like seed sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulnesses of wealth, and the desires for other things come and choke out the word making it unfruitful. 
others like seeds sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, and some 100 times what was sown. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm reminded of the story of a pastor. He was leaving the building one day during the middle of the week to go to lunch, and he looked across the street and he saw a small boy who was trying to reach up at a home and hit the doorbell, but he was so small he couldn't quite get his finger on the button. So the pastor, thinking he would do something nice, went across the street and he pressed the doorbell. Then he squatted down next to the young man and said, well, now what do we do? And the little boy turned to the pastor and said, run. (laughs) All right. Will you please pray with me? Lord God, may the meditations of all of our hearts gathered this day, and may the words that flow from my lips truly be pleasing in your sight. For Lord, you are both our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our lesson for this morning, oftentimes referred to as the parable of the sower, is also found in the Synoptic Gospels in Matthew chapter 13 and in Luke chapter 8. Indeed, the the Synoptic Gospels, and that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they contain many parables of Jesus. And this is the very first one that we encounter in the Gospel of Mark as we work our way through that that Gospel this summer. Um, Our English word parable comes from the Greek word parabole, which literally means uh, to throw alongside, which comes to mean by extension, it's a comparison an illustration or an analogy. And Jesus typically uses parables as a teaching device in the form of a short story and bases it on the common experience of the people who are gathered around him listening. For example, most people who would have heard Jesus speaking about throwing seed and planting uh, 2,000 years ago for this parable would have been very familiar with that process in their lives. So as we approach the text from this morning, we need to understand that when we come to Mark chapter 4, it's already been a long day for Jesus. If we go back into chapter 3, which we know from Matthew 13, those items took place on the same day, we learn that Jesus' mother, right, the Blessed Mother Mary, And his brothers had come to him in an attempt to forcibly take him back to Nazareth in order to protect him from himself. Then he was accused by scribes who were present as he was teaching of working in collusion with Beelzebub. And Beelzebub is the prince of all devils and demons. He is Satan himself. To which Jesus issued a very solemn warning against unforgivable blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Then finally, he had proclaimed the shocking fact that his true mother and his true brother were not his earthly relations, who were there before him at that time, hoping to take him home, but they were, quote, whoever does God's will. Imagine how that was received by Mary and James and Joseph and his other brothers who may have been present. So now we know it is the afternoon that he has left the house in Capernaum and Galilee and gone down to the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee in order to teach. And we read, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables. So, to help us visualize this morning, I'm a visual learner. When I'm reading a book, if there's a chart, a graph, or a map, I find that very helpful. 
Uh, but uh, just to help us kind of visualize what's happening, for the last several chapters in the Gospel of Mark, the crowds have been getting larger and larger as Jesus has been teaching, preaching, and performing supernatural miracles. And people are being drawn to him for a number of reasons. Right? Is Jesus a prophet? Like the prophets of old, perhaps Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or Elijah? Or perhaps he is the promised Messiah, the anointed one of God, who is coming to liberate them from their oppressors. We don't know exactly what is in their heart, but surely they were wondering how in the world this uneducated man from northern Israel could teach with such power and with such authority, challenging the religious practices of the day, and the religious leaders in their communities. Jesus leaves the bank of the Sea of Galilee, we're told, and he pushes out into the water in a fishing boat. So imagine an amphitheater, right? The, the, it must have been a, a fairly steep embankment along the water. The people are sitting along the embankment, and Jesus pushes back away, and he probably does this for a number of reasons, but one would have been acoustically. If Jesus is out on the water and he's speaking, his voice is going to bounce off the water and go up, much like the old soundboards used to do inside sanctuaries and auditoriums. If you've ever been inside an older sanctuary, this one used to have one, when it was first built, above the, the pulpit or above a lectern, there would have been a long wooden panel. And as the person was speaking, their voice would bounce off that panel and go out into the crowd. Well, it's the same function with the water. As Jesus is speaking, his voice is bouncing off the water and going up into the people. And as Jesus looks at that gathering of people that are all around him that day, he could see men and see women and see children in all different places regarding their spiritual lives with God. Some of them would have been faithful and fervent in their love for God, being drawn to Jesus because they love God with their heart, soul, mind, and strength. But other people may have been merely observant of the law of God, but not lovers of God. Right? They did the things they were supposed to do. They watched how many steps they took on the Sabbath. They watched their diets. They, were, they made sure that they were, they were ritually clean at all times. But that doesn't mean that they loved God. And other people there surely were struggling with faith cautious, not sure what they believed. And Jesus, looking into that true diversity of perspectives and beliefs that were before him, told them the parable about seed being sown by a farmer. And let's listen to the first part of that one more time. Jesus said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. And yet still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up, grew, produced a crop, some multiplying 30, 60, and some 100 times. And then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Afterwards, when they were alone, away from the crowds, Jesus' disciples asked him what the meaning of the parable was. And if you've read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, not so much in, in John, you'll know that, that Je some of Jesus' parables don't have explanations. And they can be difficult, they can be awkward to fully understand, comprehend, and, and to place them within the sphere of understanding the nature and kingdom of God. But that's not the case with this parable. Because Jesus tells his disciples exactly what he means by the teaching. He told them the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. 
But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but not perceiving, ever hearing but not understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. And he's quoting from Isaiah right there. And, and, and basically, what he is saying, we believe, is that those people who do not earnestly seek the kingdom of God, those who do not really want to understand and know who Jesus is, will never understand his teaching through parables. Their minds, their hearts have been locked away from it. Then Jesus said, don't you understand the parable? How then will you understand any of them? Farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, Jesus said, are like seeds sown among thorns. They hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. And others, like seeds sown on good soil, they hear the word, they accept it, and it produces a crop. Seeds are a powerful symbol for the Word of God springing to life within the lives of followers of Jesus. Within every seed, there is an almost infinite potential for life. And I like to think of a piece of fruit. It doesn't matter if it's a pomegranate, an apple, an orange, a pear. When you open the fruit, you encounter anywhere from one to a handful of seeds. If these seeds are planted, and they're cared for, and they're tended, and they're watered, and they get sunlight, those seeds can produce a seemingly countless number of new fruit. The seeds of one orange or one apple could produce enough orange or apple trees to eventually compromise or comprise an orchard. And those seeds could then go on to produce an immeasurable amount of fruit, all from one tiny seed. From one piece of fruit, carefully tended and cared for when it's planted. This is the power of God's Word within our lives. So the sower in the parable is, of course, Jesus, but it's also anybody who is teaching or preaching or sharing God's Word, whether it be from a pulpit or in conversation among friends or family or neighbors. The soil represents the varying conditions of human hearts on which that seed is tossed. We just celebrated Independence Day. And in the land of the free, we often confuse the true nature of freedom. For many of us, freedom has become synonymous with personal independence, with all of the rights that I've been bestowed. The ability to make our own decisions and choose our own path in life, to do whatever we want, whenever we want. But this is not the freedom of which God intends for us in Christ Jesus that we have all been given. When Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah, he said that he had come to earth to proclaim freedom. And on another occasion, he said, if the Son of Man sets you free, you will be free indeed. See, Jesus was not setting us free to do whatever we wanted. He was freeing us to do what we ought to do. He was liberating us to walk in relationship with God and to be the kind of people that God created us to be. The spiritual freedom in Christ has with it the ability to obey God and choose his will for our lives and to have joy as we do so. This is the freedom in Christ that sin has long denied us. If you have been resistant to the gospel, 
or if you have simply been a religious rule follower, or if you have perhaps been a a, a lukewarm Christian, you are one of those troublesome soils where the seed of God's word, his love for us in Christ Jesus, is not properly taking root. It's not being cared for. It's not being tended. But God provides for us the opportunity to become fertile soil. God desires for all of us to receive the gift of grace that he desires to give for us in Christ Jesus. And when we receive this gift of grace, which is difficult to do because we're a transactional people, Americans want to earn their way. Americans want to buy something if they need it. They, Americans are also willing to trade or to barter for something. But when it comes to this gift of grace, which God desires to give to us, you can't do any of that. We can't buy it, trade for it, or even be deserving of it. All we can do is receive it. And when we have received this gift, which God desires to give, the Holy Spirit takes us, shapes us, molds us as a potter shapes clay and enables our very hearts, our spirits, our very selves to become the fertile soil which God desires to plant his word in. Indeed, the Gospel of John, in the Gospel of John, in the sixth chapter, Jesus proclaims, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at that last day. One place where God comes to us when we love Him when we have received the gift that he desires to give to us, is at this table. This is just a simple table. It's not an altar. We don't come here. We don't bow before it. We don't make sacrifices here. The idea is that this is a table where the people of God come to be gathered together with Jesus sitting at the head of the table. The table is at the same level as the people of God. And here Jesus meets us in the bread and in the cup. And within our tradition, we believe that Jesus is spiritually present in the bread and in the cup. And when we participate in this very special meal which he has given to us, we are shaped, we are formed We are molded, we are encouraged, we are strengthened to be the people that God desires for us to be. We live in a hard world. We live in a world that is no longer a place where Christians, practicing Christians, are the majority people. Practicing Christian people are a distinct particular minority within the United States of America and Canada. We're used to always being in power, having authority, whether that be at the local, state, or federal level. But that's all changed. And we need to learn what it means to be a joyful people of Jesus, shaping the culture, loving the people by investing in them, by loving them, by nurturing them. But we can only do that if we ourselves have allowed the Lord to shape us, to nurture us, to provide for us as fertile soil for the work of the Holy Spirit. So as we come to the table today, let us do so with joyful hearts. Let us do so with an expectation that God has indeed chosen us, that God has loved us, and God has paid a terrible price through the life, death, and resurrection of his son to claim us as his own. And as we come to that table today, I encourage you to rise, if you're able, as we confess the faith of the church through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus said, come to me, all of you that are weary in carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Will you please pray with me? It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. You established your people to be a light for the nations and called us to walk in your paths and to follow your ways. Even now, you are coming to bring justice and peace into the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all of the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Despite our brokenness and our sinfulness, Lord, you did not break your covenant promises to us. In Christ Jesus, you drew near to us for our salvation, teaching us to live in faith and to seek the good of all. Through his dying and rising, you brought life to the world. And remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this cup, and we joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we expectantly await the day of his second coming. It is with thanksgiving that we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break and the cup that we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ Jesus. Transform these simple elements of the earth into the mysterious and the holy. By your Spirit, unite us with Christ and with your church in all of the world. Keep us faithful and alert for the hour of Christ's coming. Let us live honorably as children of truth and light, so that we may eat and drink together in your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. And as the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In that letter to the church at Corinth, the Apostle Paul goes on to write, For I received from the Lord that which I pass on to you, that on the night in which he was arrested, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks to his heavenly Father, he broke the loaf, saying, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In a like manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This cup represents the new covenant, the new promise sealed in my blood for the remission of sin. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and you drink from this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus until he comes again in final victory. This is not the table of First Presbyterian Church. This is not the table of our denominational home. This is the table of the Lord. All who love him, all who have received him, are welcome here. Could the communion servers please come forward? The sanctuary is divided into four quadrants, one, two, three, and four. Uh, sections one and two, if you could please come uh, to this station, three and four to this station. And we'll begin with uh, stations or <laughs> sections one and three. If you could please come as, as you're led by the Lord.
body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. I invite you at this time, if you're able, to rise, and we will sing the benediction together.